Hi, everybody. So we're live, right? Yes. <laughs> Hi, it's Trish. I'm one of the admins in our group. Um, I'm here with my husband, Jim. He's going to be my eyes today and read questions off the page. But our main uh, guest is Kate McGoy Smith. Hi, Kate. Welcome. Hi. So Kate has been brought up in our group several times about um, diet uh, and how she had such great success with a whole food, uh, plant-based diet. And so Kate, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thank you so much, my husband, Jim, for inviting me today. Um, I'm really impressed with your group and I, as a result, I've become a member as well. And uh, I didn't know people even know, knew of me or my existence, but uh, I'm so glad to be able to be with you today. Um, my name is Kate McGoy Smith, and I'm a former registered nurse, and I have my master's in clinical social work, and I've been practicing for over 25 years. Um, my last position was to start a free on site counseling program for an entire school board. And when I became sick with pulmonary arterial hypertension, I was supervising 12 counselors in 13 school sites. Also, mm -hmm. I'm a mother of three and a homework helper, so I was a really busy person. Yes. Uh, and I've been in the areas of family therapy, addictions, and mental health, and used a very much a solution-focused approach to my work, which really relies on the person, their own expertise, because no one knows the situation better than ourselves. And then finding this, helping people to find the solution within. So I'm kind of work as a navigator as such, uh, okay. as they're along their journey. And so it's out of gratitude that my husband and I formed ForkSmart.org. And we're situated in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, uh, country for those who may or may not know about it. Um, and uh, what we try to do is do a number of community contribution projects, uh, like a monthly potluck, um, special events where we kind of be ambassadors to restaurants and say, hey, can you convert certain foods into more whole plant-based menu items? And as well, we offer a, a summit each year, and our 2020 summit's going to feature Dr. Um, Michael Greger, and as who is the author of How Not to Die and a uh, host of nutritionfacts.org, as well as uh, T. Colin Campbell, who's a PhD biochemist, um, Professor Emerson at Cornell University, and has written the book, um, The China Study. He's brought a, a revised revision of it, as well as uh, books like Whole and the Carb Fraud. And he's been featured in documentaries like Forks Over Knives. And then we have Dr. Shane Williams, who's a Canadian cardiologist, who's worked with thousands of patients. And uh, he's going to talk about how he helps people transition to a whole plant-based diet. Okay. So, yeah. so how, tell me, how yeah. did you get to the point that this was the diet that you chose? Did you try other diets? Did you... Well, I was being, I would be like a flexitarian. I wasn't, um, I was mostly uh, using, having vegetarian foods. Certainly I started as a child and a teenager and a young adult, and even into my sort of thirties as kind of, um, I would say like, you know, a standard American diet of meat, potatoes, dairy, that kind of thing. And then we, we, my husband and I decided to be vegetarian and, um, uh, and I would occasionally have chicken, very occasionally. And uh, so that's why you said flexitarian. And um, I was just getting progressively worse. I was diagnosed in December. I remember this really well. My first medication was December 20th after a right heart cath, 2007. And in November, I was diagnosed by a sleep specialist because I was diagnosed with severe obstructive sleep apnea. And she told me I had two to five years to live. And she was provisionally diagnosing me with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. And she was unsure how I'd even manage to be able to work. Um, and um, because when I originally went in with the sleep apnea, they said, oh, don't worry if you follow the protocol, your heart will remodel because I had severe right-sided heart failure. Uh, the radiologist actually came out, he was 
literally um, looked really upset and said, you've got to get to the doctor like right away. And I remember my legs shaking and I stood up against the wall just so I could hold myself up because I'm wow. not, that's really unusual. You never see the radiologist is like the wizard of Oz. You never see who's behind the curtain, you know? Right. Yeah. He came out and said, like, you're, I thank God you're still here. You need to go to the doctor right away. Wow. Started the journey, a nine month journey of really trying to explore what was wrong with me. And I was sent from one specialist to another. And I was very lucky because many times it takes over two or more years to diagnose this disease because there are so many symptoms of it, as many of the people who are, are with us today um, will realize that there's so many symptoms to it that. Um, you know, really medicine is about, and I know this even as a nurse, I've worked both in the operating room and at the bedside for a number of years, is that medicine's more about being a detective. You know, it's more a process of elimination than being able to go right away immediately. Aha, I know what it is. You know, we have to eliminate right. this and this and this, because this is a very serious diagnosis. If if you should make the wrong diagnosis, you're giving people chemotherapy level drugs that are very potent and hard on your body with lots of side effects, and which can do more damage, unfortunately, than perhaps yeah. benefit to people at times, and depending on their reaction. Um, so when I was given that news, um, I was put on the level one drugs, although I was a level three, three and a half or so out of the four. And uh, it was, of course, as people know as a Viagra or Sedanafil. And, um, and a lot of people maybe not realize that this was originally a heart medication that they discovered that had very interesting side effects for its male, male users of it. <laughs> right. it, I have to say it lowered the cost of the drug because it became more popular. <laughs> um, and uh, because it's a vasodilator and that's really what we want is we want the blood vessels to dilate. And it's interesting in, and so I began searching, but I was getting, I was rapidly getting worse. I ended up actually going from an ambulatory state to being in a wheelchair and uh, being on oxygen up to six liters, uh, put it, being put on the monitoring list for a lung transplant. Wow. Uh, within months of starting the Viagra, I was, became blind, legally blind. So, so it was that cause as a side effect from it the, was actually a combination, Trish. I had also been prior to, like I was noticing I had a lot of fatigue and I had some lower leg swelling and even my abdomen seemed kind of swollen. And um, I went into what we have here is like urgent care. It's like a, a community emergency clinic. Okay. Uh, and so I went in and they diagnosed me as having type two diabetes. And as a nurse, I thought I should have known better, you know, as a former nurse, I should know better. But at the same time, I know that I was working very, very hard and with three kids and doing a counseling program and doing some private practice on the side. And it was just, I thought, it's just about exhaustion, not, not the diabetes, the fatigue of, from diabetes. And sure. um, my A1C, believe it or not, which is a three-month marker, a blood test for a three-month marker, Right. Mine was 15.1. I don't know how that 15? Wow. That's, that's impressive. That's, 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 that's how much impressive. I put myself on the back burner. And I think a lot of women can relate to that. You know, wow. everybody else gets served before you. And you just yeah. keep putting it off and putting it off. And um, and so I, I started then to look around. And during that time period, my husband... Uh, found um, you, we found this Dr. Neil Bernard's work. I mean, he deal, Dr. Neil Bernard, for some people who may not know of him, he's he did a PBS special many years ago, but um, he's found at PCRM.org. That's Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine.org. It's an international nonprofit headquartered in Washington, D.C., and it's a plethora, just so plentiful with information for people. Um, and he wrote out a book about reversing diabetes. Okay. And that was 
extremely helpful. And I, I sort of got started with that. And I was actually able to get my blood sugar down to in the sort of sevens, high sevens with metformin. Okay, so this at this point, you don't know that you have pH. I don't know. And okay. then within a, several months of that, then I found out I had pH. They put me on the Viagra and then or Sedanafil. And then within months of that, I lost my sight. I became legally blind. Okay. And so that's where the combination happened. It was diabetic retinopathy from in my eyes. It was a lack of oxygen to my eyes. And then it was the pH drugs themselves. Okay. So it was a triple okay, so combination. Was so my retinologist at the time, and I was so glad that my husband Andrew was there because I'm sure other people feel this. And I always recommend this as a nurse is that you have a supporter there because sometimes you think you're hearing everything. It just is sort of sitting on the surface and it doesn't sink in. Sure. And, right. um, and the retinologist said, I said, well, what can I do? Like I'm blind now. And I had three young kids. I had some, a, a child, uh, my daughter Morgan was in um, grade school. And my son, Thomas, was in middle school, and um, my older son, Chris, was in high school. So they were really busy, and they needed their support. I bet, support. We had no grandparents, no relatives that lived anywhere near us in the whole country, like in that whole province or anything. Right. And, um, and so uh, he said to me, Kate, you have a choice. It's between your eyes and your lungs. What do you want to do? Wow. And you know what? It only took me, believe it or not, if I had someone else, like if I had read that about a story, I'd think, oh my God, I'd be devastated. I didn't feel devastated. It was like almost like I was given this gift of from God or whoever said, you know, I just felt a real calm. And I, within seconds, I said, I know what I want to do. I need to hug my children more than see them. And so it was like, I'll continue with what I'm doing. Because I didn't know that there was anything else I could do to help myself. Sure. Yeah. When I was diagnosed, there was two things I promised my kids. Um, we didn't tell them the diagnosis, the prognosis, I should say. And I asked them not to go on the internet because, of course, even the doctors warned us, don't go on the internet. There's a lot of yeah. stuff and some of Terrifying. information and everything. So I said to them, I will try to answer any of your questions. But I can, I promise you I'll take worry away from you. And this is how I can do it. I'm going to try to get as well as possible um, and, and do everything possible to get as well as possible. And the second thing is I know I still have, I have a responsibility to somehow make a contribution. I don't know what it'll look like, but I will do that as well. And that's been my North Stars on this journey, you know. Okay. And, um, and so I kept searching, and my husband is a PhD in theoretical chemistry, and he does environmental risk analysis and mathematical modeling. And he's really interested, and we both share a desire to um, um, live a square life, if you know what I And what I mean by a square life, I'm borrowing Dr. Esselstyn's term, is that you go along and you're happy and you're stable. And then, you know, in your 80s or 90s, you get a really bad cold and your natural immunity you maybe can't fight it off anymore. And within six weeks or so, you die. And I know that sounds maybe dramatic, but, you know, I don't want a lingering. I don't want my old age to be one that's lingering in horrible health for 10, 12 years. Right. Right. And that's, I mean, I, I told you before we get on here is that I help a lot of dogs that have cancer and, and yeah. there's really good response that the dogs get this quality of life and they're feeling great. But then when it's time, it goes pretty quick. It and does. you know, the owners are devastated, but it's like, isn't that the way that it's yeah. kind of nice. It's kind of nice. I'm that's the way you want it. A lot of people say I'd rather be by a boss or whatever, but I know that working on the other side of that, uh, people who go through traumatization is that there'd be a lot of people traumatized by that. So sure. I'd rather just quietly be able to go in my sleep, you know, because that it's just old age and that's it, you know? Sure. It's right. End of the clock kind of thing. 
Right. I guess my husband and I both talked about that, you know, that we just don't want it. Because I saw that as a nurse. Some of my first nursing experiences were in a, what they called extended care. So you saw people lingering for years and years and literally, you know, just lying yeah. in bed all the time and hardly having anybody to visit or anything like that. So yeah. I don't want that to happen for either of sure. So, you know, so I, what happened was one night, uh, being blind, I really couldn't even see television. In fact, um, you know, I know you live in the state. Stephen Colbert was on, and when I heard, I could hear it, but I couldn't even read that it was said comedy, even though we had a really big screen TV, if you can imagine. And when I heard him, I thought, oh, he must be a Fox News broadcaster. <laughs> And I found it later when I decided, oh, that was the call because I turned it off right away. I thought, this guy's crazy. <laughs> and I turned it off because I, you know, it, it's a whole different world when you're blind. You really um, don't yeah. always get the context of things, you know. Sure. Right. And um, so one night, what happened is we have um, a, a, a national host who, de who did a. Um, a live interview show named George Dropanopoulos. And he came on one night and he just said this at the very beginning. It's just amazing that I was able to catch it. Um, I, I just happened to turn on the TV and he said, um, I saw a documentary called Forks Over Knives. It changed my life. It might change yours. That's all I'm going to say. And I was so curious about it. I wondered, like, what is he talking about? And I had just gotten a um, grant for a um, uh, voice activated program for my computer through the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. Because what I planned to do, my next step was to write goodbye stories to my children. Because I wanted to leave them with something because it didn't look like I would ever see my daughter even get out of grade eight, eight kind of get to grade eight. And um, so I went on. And they told me Forks Over Knives, it was this documentary. So I wrote to the producers and about a year later it came to Calgary. And we happened to, we saw it. Well, I went, actually saw it sort of when I say saw it, I could hear it more than I could see it. And it, <laughs> okay. took, it took me two flights of stairs because it was an old theater to climb up to it, which was like County Mount Everest. I'm sure you can imagine. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Um, and um, and we were so moved by it that we ended up taking our kids to it twice more. And we said, this wow. is how we can eat. And I okay. haven't looked back since. So that's, okay, so that's how you got to the diet. So, that's so, how talk, so talking a little bit more about the diet, is it, sure. I know it's whole food, it's plant-based. I yeah. think I've heard you say no oil, which we'll get to in a second, but yeah. tell me this is, is it, do you eat it raw? Or is it is it cooked too? No, it's a combination of those foods. It's it's a, if you think of your plate, it's fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes with and not using oil to cook with or put in baked goods. So with no oil. And I will tell you what happened when I watched the Forks Overnight documentary, which plays on that's what plays on Netflix. That's my dog, Jake, deciding to get attention. Um, when it plays on Netflix, there's a part where it, that I just stood up, like practically stood up in the theater. Dr. Esselstyn, who is of the Cleveland Clinic, he's a, he was on the, he was the head of the breast task force. And um, he knew that as he, he was approaching his retirement years, he wanted to do some special projects. And one of them is he thought, you know, cancer is such a big disease to look at preventing and, and, and dealing with um, and treating and reversing, hopefully, or, or at least having people survive it, is that he looked at heart disease. And uh, one of the things that, so he began doing all his work and he did over a 10 year, well, really longitudinal, but it's well over 10 years. Um, he was about 25 years study with people and showed that he could take what we almost considered the walking dead and help them reverse their heart disease wow. and not even have, and these were people that were told by their cardiologists and their medical team, like, this is it. We have nothing else to offer you. 
and okay. go home and sit on your rocker and have whatever kind of life you can until it's not home. acceptable to me. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what he did is he took about 10 subjects and he may have been a bit long, 25, 25 subjects, sorry. And, um, and you know what? He had set, he had really great success that people didn't have repeat. You know, of the people that follow the diet, they didn't have repeat incidents, even of palpitations and things like that. So me. Wow. So he ended up writing a book called Prevent Reverse Heart Disease, which is an excellent book. And what in the big messages he had is in our body, we have 60,000 miles of blood vessels and arteries. And in the innermost um, part of the artery is this lining on the innermost side of the, the artery. And it's called the endothelium cells. And they do something really, really important. And it was only discovered in the 1980s. So this is really relatively new in our whole medical history. Is and it won a Nobel um, Prize uh, for it for the discoverers. Is that nitric oxide gases actually help our blood vessels constrict and dilate, constrict and dilate, and that's exactly what we need to power ourselves as we go up and down stairs, for example. It's an action of constricting and dilating our blood vessels to help pump ourselves up the stairs. Okay. And one of the things he talked about is, and I remember at a symposium for pulmonary hypertension, my pulmonologist was presenting and he said, we don't know what the cause or the cure is. However, what we do find is that there's a thickening of the endothelium lining. And when okay. Dr. Hasselstyn then talked about that, so you can imagine, so for a patient with pH, they already have a thickening of the lining, so that's making the blood vessel smaller. Then you follow the standard American diet that is full of um, animal products like meats and dairies. You're actually making, with all that fat, even smaller. You're constricting them even more. Then you add oil that we have. You can go to any, what I call the window diet, any uh, fast food place, and you can get fries and stuff like that, right? And we have sure. a lot of dry things. Well, we, we found out that one tablespoon, just one tablespoon of oil can slow your blood flow up to three to five hours and stop it in parts of your body. Okay, so you're, you're talking animal fats and you're talking, you know, horrible fats at the fast yeah. food restaurants and stuff. And what about oil? What about plant-based? Yeah, it's all oil. For example, so coconut, olive oil, avocado yeah. oil. Yeah, coconut oil, for example, is very trendy right now. It's a very hot thing. But if you really look at the nutritional ingredient list, which is kind of like the, the lie detector of a product, I'd like to call it, as well as the ingredient list, is it's 90% saturated fat. So it may be plant-derived, but it's been so processed. Oil is the most processed product you can have. And it's nine, nine, gram, nine grams of, nine calories of fat compared to, nine grams of, of fat compared to um, four grams of carbohydrates. So it's double that and it only has traces of vitamin K. So there's no nutrient value to having oils. What it is, is oils is really more about habit and the habit of tasting something that has oil and the habit of cooking with oil. But you know what? And I, I could line up people, 100 people, and I could say to them, okay, I've got this skillet. It's got oil in it, whether it's olive oil, avocado oil, or lard. And I want you to put that down your drain. Now, I can't imagine there would be Anybody in that hundred who go, well, no, there's something going to happen. It's going to clog my drain. I don't want that to happen. I'll put it in a dish. I'll, I'll put it in some kind of other thing, but I'm not going to put it down my drain because that's the worst thing. And if I do end up washing it, even after I've drained most of it off, I'm going to use a detergent that is really strong. It's a grease killer, a grease cutter to be able to, you think about Dawn and it says, those poor birds that are all stuck, you know, with oil and stuff, and they use right. Dawn to right. Right. Well, can you imagine pouring Dawn down your throat? 
your delicate tissues and everything. We don't have. I, I, I wouldn't with the list of chemicals on that. No. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So my okay. question then is, I guess what I'm trying to get is Trish, there's a lot like we don't have um, scrubbers inside us to be right. able to clean out that. And okay. so I was really shocked because even as a nurse, I was given absolutely no education on nutrition at all. And most doctors are not no. given any I think nutrition and not vets. It, it, out, it was 19 hours in their entire years of practice. And of that, it was only two and a half had to do something with food. Most of it had to do with pharmacological reactions with food. Okay. So, okay. So you don't use any fat. No. But how do you how do you get your omega threes? I know that there's flaxseed oil, but that's still an oil, yeah. um, and and it's it's better to get it from a, a an animal source yeah. to even out them omega sixes and omega threes. So well, how how does your Colin Campbell, who's written over three hundred fifty papers, and they're all peer reviewed, which is really more that it's a like the gold standard for scientific work because peer reviewed means that you have another group of scientists who checks the reliability and validity of what you have said that you've gotten in your own research results. And they're not tied to a, a product source, whether it's a broccoli, it's trying to sell some broccoli or it's trying to sell a meat product or whatever it is. It's not tied to that at all. And um, they're just trying to check, is it reliable and valid what you've come up with? And he talks about as long as you have what we call a rainbow on your plate, you will have the right balance. Now, to add to that, if you want, and Dr. Esselin talks about this, adding one tablespoon of ground flaxseed uh, to your breakfast cereal. That's it. And there's no worries with regard to it. It will okay. balance itself out. And that's all you need to do. And you can just have the ground food um, ground up, put in like a mason jar in your fridge and to check. And it can stay there for quite a long time and you can smell it. If it smells like kind of rancid, uh, like an oil smell, like you would smell on paint, then you know to throw that out, that it's no longer good. Okay. Um, but that's all you need. Something very simple and, you know, because many people end up adding a lot of supplements and different things. And uh, to be honest, it makes a lot of expensive urine more than the absorption that food can give you. Okay. Um, you know what she's eating cat food. Sorry, my dog's being naughty while I'm on here. Um, so how long after you started the diet did you start to feel better? I, well, you know, I couldn't even exercise. I, I was like, I couldn't walk from you know, probably across a double driveway. I couldn't walk across that without almost having to stop halfway. That, okay. um, I, I relate. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, we, you know, it's sort of like, because I, my husband used to call, like, we call me the Energizer Bunny. And so it was like someone took out my battery packs. <laughs> yeah. And, and I still, I have this problem still, and maybe you can relate too, is that, yeah. you know, when I'm exercising, my body still wants to go, go, go. And then I check my oxygen. I'm like, oh, I have to slow down. It's such, it's, yeah. it's hard. It's hard to yeah. really, you really have to listen to your body at this point. You yeah. do, yeah. And, and you have to, so I, when I started it, I decided to, I wrote to Dr. Esselstyn myself after I saw the um, documentary, because I read that he will, he would, um, be willing to hear from emails from heart patients. And I didn't know if he would, you know, I had severe right sided heart failure, but I didn't know if that would be enough for him. Like I hadn't had a heart attack, sure. or anything, which was fortunate. Um, but within two days, the secretary wrote me back and said, he he's willing to talk to you. Oh, yeah. okay. So I was thrilled. It was sort of like the Pope, the Beatles, everybody, Mother Teresa called, everybody called. I was so thrilled. And I talked to him, and a couple things he told me was certainly to follow a plant-based diet, was just fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes. But he also said to increase the nitric oxide to dark green leafy vegetables. So I would eat, and I was supposed to have that six times a day. So for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and in between those times. Okay. That time. And, and I truly, I, I believe that I do a uh, smoothie. 
Yeah, um, I don't add fruit to it. I except a, a little lime, it helps get it down. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I do spinach and I do, you know, fruits yeah. and vegetables, well, fruits, vegetables that basil dilate. And, yeah. you know, I, I try to do that at the very least once a day. Um, oh, he's, it's, what kind of dog is he? It, it is a half poodle, quarter Bichon, quarter Pomeranian. We call him a walking buffet. <laughs> Cute. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so what I do is I steam the greens because Dr. Esselstyn, I know you mentioned smoothies, and that's often a good way to, for some people, they find that a helpful way to start. He doesn't recommend them only because um, what he says is better to chew your food because it's better release of the nitric oxide. And what happens is it actually um, it goes into our body, but the gastric juices come back into our mouth. So the next bite of food that isn't uh, a nitric oxide food, let's say like potato, ends up getting wrapped in all these nitric oxide juices. So you get a second exposure to it. And okay. the mechanism set. So we, what we did is a paper called, um, and I think I, I believe I posted it on your website, uh, on the website, your page. And it's the okay. reverse and prevent um, reversal of pulmonary hypertension, diabetes, and retinopathy after the adoption of a whole plant-based diet. And we have literally six years of not doing this diet until I found out about it, and then six years after. So I'm really being my own control, you know, okay. right? Seeing the before and after of this by way of health records. And um, one of the things is that. Uh, my husband did research in a, an international search and uh, looked at nitric oxide index. So arugula, believe it or not, that sort of um, peppery, green, right. uh, uh, leafy vegetable uh, that is is um, really actually quite delicious, is the highest in nitric oxide. You're getting really. The I did not know. Okay. Yeah, it's most power that you could get. There's certainly kale and bok choy and beets and beet greens and um, Swiss chard and broccoli and these other greens that are wonderful. And in um, Dr. Esselstyn, Ann Esselstyn, his wife, wrote this book, Prevent Reverse Heart Disease with their wife, Jane. And he has a beginning in the beginning chapter. I just marked it. There's 12 steps to the plant plant perfect eating he talks about of what to do. And um, and I'm just looking here, oh, greens. So dark leafy green vegetables like kale, mustard greens, um, you know, all of those kind of things can, it's it's just, so I use I eat arugula every single day. Spinach is another one, but I eat arugula. And I used to have to have iron uh, iron um, infusions. Infusions. I no longer have to at all. That's awesome. That's yeah. great. Wow. Yeah. So, um, and the arugula, like what we did, we did the health economics of this. And in okay. comparison, our drugs, my drugs cost me, if I, when I was on Bosatin, for example, on the oral medication, it was about 3000 And then I was on Remodulin which was subcutaneous with a pump mm -hmm. next step before flow land. And it was over a hundred thousand a year. So um, probably this is about a $5 day cost in comparison. Wow. So, difference. Yeah. So, so tell me this, I know that and my husband's going to bring up the questions that we have on the group. I asked people to, yeah. to leave their questions, but I know that one question that someone had is that if people are on the medications that mm -hmm. are, are, you know, vasodilating really good from the medicines, sure. is it a good idea for them to add more fruits and vegetables that are going to cause more vasodilation? And in my opinion, I'm thinking that that's great, but Let's hear what you think. I, I, I had a chance to look at a couple of questions beforehand. And I know Coumadin has come up too as a blood thinner. That's not an unusual thing to, to, I mean, it's not, for example, as a pH patient, I was advised by my pulmonologist, if I was in a car ride, get out about every two hours and move around. So I don't get my, let my blood pool too much. And I, okay. I've been subject to a blood clot that I'm aware of but it was just a precautionary and I do that. 
Um, and so, with, like, for example, let's say you're on Coumadin, you can actually follow a plant-based diet and eat greens. It's not contraindicated. I know that they'll tell you when you're first on Coumadin, like do not eat greens or whatever. But if you tell your doctor, this is what you want to do, they can then adjust the medication. Right. Um, and that's it. They tell me that because I'm, I'm on Eloquist now, but originally yeah. they had me on that. And yeah. when they said, no spinach, no this, and I'm like, no, no, I said, I can't do that. I said, what you're telling me in my head is going, <laughs> I'm like, I said, yeah. you can't tell me that I'm sick and that I can't eat anything that's good for me. I said, I can't. Yeah. So they're like, okay, and, we're going to rethink what we have they, you on. They can make adjustments. It's just a matter of, you know, one of the things that I've always told patients this, whether from a nursing perspective or a social work perspective is you have to be your own advocate. Absolutely. And bring supporters along if you need to, but unless you really, you know, and I'm actually been named the first, been appointed the first cardiac um, advisor, a patient advisor for Peter Lockheed here, a major cent a hospital center here. And one of the things is it's so important that you be your own advocate because that's real partnership in your healthcare. Yeah. Um, because you're the one who has to steer the ship. You're the one who holds right. the star of saying, this is my North Star. I want to be able to do this, this, and this. Be well enough for this, this, and this. And yeah. I have to figure out a way to get there, and I need your help to do it. Right. Because um, bottom line, doctors rely on, rely on your compliance when they give you a medication. Um, sure. you, know, you know, whether it's an antibiotic, a simple round of 10 days, they, if you're not compliant for those 10 days, we might feel better after five and we stop taking it, we end up getting sicker usually. Sure. So it's really right. always dependent. So you're, you're the, you really do steer the ship, even though it feels, I know, it felt almost worse, believe it or not, when I was diagnosed terminally was to think I could be, I'd be a patient the rest of my life. Because I wondered yeah. how small my voice would get and I really encourage you it's you don't have to roar you just have to quietly and firmly say this is what I need yeah and yeah I completely doing. agree with that yeah um I'm I'm steering my own ship the doctors are like are you listening to us <laughs> no <laughs> but I mean you know I, I am doing it not the way that a lot of people are doing it but it doesn't mean then I'm not treating it. You know, I'm not no, sitting here thinking that I'm not doing no, anything. I, I was accused at one point, I was very sick in the hospital at one point um, because I ended up getting a lot of this fluid. I ended up gaining 80 pounds of fluid. I had a real reaction to the remodulin and all that kind of stuff. And I remember um, a nurse said to me, well, I think you're in denial about your disease. And I was like, no, you know, no, I'm yeah. not guess what my disease has been living room with me i don't choose just to choose to have it sit right beside me i have it in the corner but it's still in the living room i'm very aware of it oh you're yeah, um, right right with, like the difficult neighbor next door i'm aware of them but i'm not leaving my windows wide open so that they can blast their stereo and i have an uncomfortable day and an unhappy day as a result i i have a right to to Pull, push down the window, maybe close the curtains if necessary, so I can have peace within my own sphere, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so, a good way to put it. It's an unwelcome neighbor that's beside you, but I, I certainly can't pick up and move. That's not going to be practical or not reality. So right. it's like, how do I make the most of it? And, um, and the other thing is most people who are talking to us like this, um, if that's happened to other people who are viewing, is that they themselves don't deal with a chronic illness. Many doctors will say it's not until they themselves got sick that they realized what a patient's life was like. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's hard for people to have empathy around that or adequate enough empathy to really understand what it's like to have something that's kind of overhanging you uh, in your life. And, um, and so what I really focused on with my family is I sort of had to put on my solution focused therapist hat and say, you know what, let's all hate the disease together. Don't hate me for having the disease. Don't yeah. hate me for having the inconvenience of this disease. Let's all hate the disease together. 
And when we had a victory, it was all our victories. And when we had a failure, yeah, we all were mad about it too. Um, but we shared that rather than it was on, like that I didn't have to carry the guilt trip of, uh, you know, it's something I didn't cause. I, can, I, I I'll try to fix it as much as I can, but there's a point where you also have to live with something. Right. And so um, that was really helpful. So when going back to your question is, is it better to vasodilate? The thing is that when I walked into trying this, as, I really tried it as a research project. I went down to see Dr. John McDougall. He's a board certified medical internist in Santa Rosa, California. He's over 40 years of using nutritional therapy as part of his traditional medical practice. And he uses a plant-based, whole plant-based approach as well. He's written a book called The Starch Solution, for example. He's written 13 books, but it, one of his latest is The Starch Solution. And um, uh, so he said, like, try it on. So I went down in December of 2012, and I figured that was the absolute worst time to go. And so that's what made it the best time to go. And what I mean by that is Christmas is kind of a free pass for everybody. You know, someone brings over shortbread cookies or chocolate or, you know, big turkey dinner and mashed potatoes or gravy and all that kind of stuff. We just indulge. It's our indulge pass. You know, everybody's doing it, so why not? Sure, uh, right. But if I can get through Christmas, which has all those traditional foods in it, then I can handle anything. And we went down there and... Um, I was really glad that I did because he had five days of cooking classes and, and demonstrations and lectures and every, and we were busy from sort of, I guess, eight 30 in the morning with breakfast right through until about nine 30 at night. Wow. And I was one of the few people that didn't go have a nap at some time. <laughs> so I would soak up everything, even though I couldn't see Always everything is clearly. I sat right at the very front of the class and everything so I could see as much as I could. And um, my husband went with me, which was great uh, because it's very hard to go blind and on oxygen not knowing where you're going to. Uh, yeah. And uh, and we really teamed up and we said, this is what we want for both of us. Because he didn't want me to get well and him not to be well. You know, it's really important. It's a wonderful legacy to give to your whole family. Um, and as a result of being able to do that, then what it did is it took me to realizing uh, I, I sort of combined Esselstyn's work of using the greens and making sure I dedicated having greens to it. And then my plate had fruits and vegetables, whole grains and legumes on it. So the okay. more, so one of the things when I went into this whole project is I said, I have nothing to lose because I found out there was no morbidity. So in other words, there you cannot cause your death by eating this way. So there's no morbidity to this. Dr. Esselstyn assured us of that. And then in addition to that, I thought, you know what? If I need to have a lung transplant, they're going to check me out top to bottom about cancer and other diseases. I don't want to be eliminated because I have another disease. So sure. this really helps you protect you um, and lessen your chance of having cancer as a result. Because there are many cancers related to foods like colon cancer. We know is highly tied to absolutely right processed foods and stuff. So I felt it was like a win-win, even if I didn't get my sight back, even if I didn't get, I would at least not be causing the rest of my body to deteriorate. Right. Yeah. And that's true. That's, that's a good way to look at it. Um, and so for her to eat more vegetables and more, absolutely. Like even they said, you can like five servings a day is great, but if you want to add more, that's fantastic. Because remember, you also will eat more eating this way. And people are surprised by that because we're so used to it. And I think even as women, you know, Brene Brown talks about what's what women's particular um, vulnerability. It's around body image. You know, we're supposed to, and so, you know, we're almost, at the beginning, we go on a date, we're supposed to, oh, Oh, I'll just have a little piece of that, a little taste of that. <laughs> oh, you know. oh, it's too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I eat all this, and I just, you know, 
I'll have a pee. Thank you. Yeah, right. And then they go to the bathroom and you're like, <laughs> yeah. I'm starting to death. Yeah. Um, and uh, you're looking for the mints in your purse and everything else. Yeah, right. <laughs> so um, what I say to people is your plate is going to look a lot bigger because most of the food and people forget this. So we have to kind of break that mind barrier psychologically is that um, we actually, you know, we a lot more low calorie density, but high nutrient foods. Sure. So you're eating whole foods, they're a lot lower, lower in calorie, but they're very high in nutrients. Okay. And so we need more to fill ourselves up. Okay. And you know, so you don't have to go away when someone I wrote had someone recently wrote me and said, I seem always like kind of hungry on this. I don't have a weight problem, but it, and I said to her, I think it's because you're probably restricting. And one of the things is, even McDougall talks about the plate, it should be probably 60% starches, which is like your your potatoes, uh, your grains, your legumes, and 40% vegetables. And if wow. you're trying to lose weight, more 50-50. So, okay. you know, um, and, um, and for and, each meal, that's, that's what you're... Yeah, you might, okay. have, so you might have you might have your breakfast like I have uh, large flake oats and blueberries for breakfast. It's one of my go-to. I can make it in three minutes. I just love it, and I because I don't like porridge, but I I've been able to adjust because I know that that for example, oats are a whole grain plus they lower cholesterol. They're dose responsive, so the more you eat of them, the more actually they work for your body and they help lower cholesterol as well. And then, of course, you get so many. You get your omegas with your blueberries. It's fantastic. And you can sprinkle you know, some flax seed on that. Okay. And for breakfast, then you might have a snack. If you're not hungry, don't eat. But if you're you're feeling a bit peckish or hungry, then, um, you know, you could have an apple or something like that, some fruit in between. And then for lunch, you could have uh, something sequenced. I call it a sequenced meal. It's sort of like soup or salad to start with. And then, you know, maybe it's a sandwich with it or something like that. And then for, for lunch or for dinner, sorry, same thing. Sequence your food, um, start with your soup and then, um, go on to salads. And as there's your raw and then right. your cooked meal, like, you know, it might be a sweet potato lasagna, um, I'm trying to think, uh, I, I have a stir fry, uh, a Tuscan pasta, you know, those kind of things, a wrap. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there's quite a bit of variety and oh, yeah. Tons of variety. There's so many plants, uh, you know, like I will give you an example. Last week I took, I made allegory oil free, which is a cauliflower potato blend. And then what we did is we put it in a burrito wrapper. And then we just paninied it, and it was delicious. okay. So, like when you do a stir fry, then you don't use mm -hmm. oil. So, do you just put a little water in the pan? Yeah. Or? Okay. You actually start with just a nonstick pan, or I've even used stainless steel just from like Home Sense or one of those stores, sure. and tried them both ways. And all you have to do is I keep a, a little measuring cup right beside with some water in it. Okay. And you know, you just, if you're just standing over it, just with a wooden spoon, you start with onion and mushroom first, because they're, okay. they really release moisture, actually. Sure. Right. And you, you know, a fairly hot pan, and that helps brown and caramelize them and till they're translucent and soft. Then you add your other vegetables in. Okay. And so add in water as if it was oil. Okay. So for someone starting this diet, Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've been a carnivore for a long time and not ready to give up their meat. I yeah. know I'm not. Um, yeah. Even if they did two meals of, of this way of, of eating is, is great. And then even if that meal you're going to have some kind of protein, some kind of meat, um, you could you can limit the meat and still yeah. do a bunch yeah. of vegetables. And, yeah. and that's going to give you great results, too. It's so much better than, like you said, the standard American diet. You know, yeah. the, yeah. meat the, thing meat. Is, the thing is, it's not about like, I've never been out to try to I, when I started this. My goal is not to convert anyone to anything. It's just to make sure that they have the information so they sure. can make their own decisions. 
Yeah. And one of the things is that often people find that they can cut out, believe it or not, you know, cutting dairy is quite critical because it has an um, insulating growth hormone in it and casein, which is known to cause cancer. So yeah. it's, and it's very high in saturated fat, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's, it's not, I mean, that's the one thing that I'm really trying to, to and give really out right now is there, it, it, coat, it coats your mucous membranes. It does. So, yeah. So I mean, it's, and I do notice when I have dairy that, that that's an issue yeah. for me, but it's funny because you and I, I mean, you know, I, I, I do a lot of vegetables, a lot of vegetables, right. but the right. diets that we're doing are kind of at both ends of the spectrum. I mean, I'm doing more keto, yes. but I, I'm doing keto, but not in, you know, I'm not having bacon and eggs at every meal. I mean, no. I'm having healthy vegetables with, you know, you know, well, no. plant-based fats and stuff. So, um, but I have thought about going my two meals, yeah. doing yeah. plant-based. Um, yeah. and I think it's, it's really about, you know, for some people, they want to dive right in the, to the water kind of thing. And yeah. other people want to wade in. And so, you know, you know yourself better if, if it's better to wade into something. And so we call that crowding out your plate is so like, let's say you said, OK, I'm going to have the, let's say. I'm going to have breakfast and lunch. I will have plant-based and then dinner I will have. But I will make sure the meat is more like a condiment type of thing rather than this big sure. steak on the plate that overpowers things. And the other challenge with keto is that while it has, certainly it has helped people lose weight, for example, what some of the challenges are is it does challenge uh, um, people's kidneys and liver, and, and that's difficult. Um, and I, the other thing is that um, it's kind of like I find when you end up, what you're doing is you're kind of changing your body to rev up on fat rather than on, on the starch. And so it's a little bit like um, if you were traveling, you know, when you go to want to pass a car and you, you end up revving up your engine to be able to pass them successfully on a, an expressway or highway. Right. Imagine staying in that revved position all the way to your destination. That's what ends up happening with the keto diet. We end up really stressing out because it's very acidic in nature. And so what happens is our body will take care of us. Our body loves us so much it wants to heal. It has the so natural to heal. And it has, has that ability. <laughs> and uh, so what it'll do is it'll take calcium that in our bones and take it to neutralize the acid that's in our body. And so then what happens is people wonder why they have osteoporosis. And it's because they've had a very high acidic diet of meat and dairy and the calcium in our bones is being used to neutralize that acid. Okay. Um yeah, I, I you know, like I said, I mean, I I've been doing the keto. I I I don't do the traditional keto as far as the kind of bacon and stuff, but yeah. I do. I haven't had starches. I they're 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 the condiment for me. White yeah. bread, yeah. pasta. I haven't had any of that in I don't know how long. I also have Hashimoto, so I don't do any gluten and. Um, yeah. but this is I, actually, believe it or not, this is a, a very. I mean, most dietitians will say. Following a gluten-free diet is really, really tough because if you look and people, if people are relying on gluten-free products in grocery stores, oh yeah, then I don't. Oh, do. you probably can't horrible, for you. Yeah. horrible. Yeah. yeah, and dietitians yeah. will say it's like they almost dread having to talk to people about being on a gluten-free diet. What's so great about this way of eating is actually can be very gluten-free and yet you can get all the health benefits of a whole plant-based diet as well. Sure. And we have people that have your disease that have very been very successful in using starches and following a whole plant-based diet. Um, as I mentioned, fruits, vegetables, whole grains and legumes and have actually had their symptoms go away. Okay. 
I just, I know for me personally, if I start eating starches and pastas, I don't stop. <laughs> yeah. well, so, I if, if, if somebody, and I'm not suggesting that you need to lose weight, but if someone needs to lose weight, there are more high calorie starches like flour products, like even whole wheat pasta and things like that, that sure. most doctors, Dr. Esselstyn, Mark McDougall, Dr. T. like they would all say, well, Put off, don't have those, but have the grain type project, like the the oats or uh, the quinoa or the brown rice. There's several kinds of brown rice. There's California brown rice, there's basmati brown rice. There's just so many jasmine, like, you know, there's so many choices. Yeah. And try in quinoa and those kind of things, trying those um, things. So do, do you try to stay mostly organic too? You know what? It sort of depends on the price point and whatever, because we don't have, in this province, we have some potato agriculture and corn agriculture, but hardly anything else. Okay. And so what um, I do is, and certainly if it's organic and I can get it and I can afford it, um, I, I will use that. However, um, you can get places like Costco sell organic vegetables that are frozen. And oh, yeah. People don't realize that frozen vegetables are flash frozen, and they're kind of often at the height of their, their freshness. And if they're like an interior province or an interior state, uh, like uh, I'm in, um, we have to have food be transported by trucks. So it's not necessarily at the peak of freshness when we oh, get sure. right. So yeah, I, I I tell people do frozen compared to canned. Yeah, you know, I mean, frozen yeah. is, is not a bad thing. You right, get it yeah. like you said at the peak of freshness, it's frozen and it's yeah. good and yeah, it's not so like it's cooked. It's also a really good prep. You know, people say, well, this is a really expensive diet to be on because they look at fruits or vegetables. Well, you know, you just have to go through the frozen aisle, and I kind of say your sous chef right there. Because they will now have, if you notice, they'll have like um, mixed vegetables that are um, like, let's say a ch for a Chinese stir fry, they will have already combined them. They're already chopped for you because energy is a lot of a big issue for pulmonary hypertension patients as well. I remember when I first started, oh, absolutely, yeah. I could not even stand probably about a minute or two at the kitchen island, the kitchen tape counter. Wow. Or I had to go and sit at the dining room table and, and spend a few hours cutting up vegetables. And wow. you can imagine being blind and cutting vegetables. That's so a I little dangerous. <laughs> it was, I'll tell Sliced mushrooms, I sliced my fingers more than the mushrooms. And then Ouch. I found out, I, I didn't know this because of course I was blind, but they had sliced mushrooms available for sale. I had no idea that we could buy sliced mushrooms. <laughs> that makes and it that, easier. That, <laughs> my hands, my fingers really appreciated that. Sure, I bet. So, you know what, let's, because, so it's getting a little late. Let's, you wanna answer, yeah. ask some of the sure. questions? Sure. And just say who asked them. So, oh, okay. uh, um, Tina Trotter asked, what foods are inflammatory to PHers? I hear dairy, gluten, and sugar. Yeah, so I wouldn't necessarily say gluten, but uh, dairy. We know sugar, for example, is an inflammatory for sure. And so it's something that you don't want to add sugar to your diet, you know, the refined sugar. Now, Dr. Esselstyn, as I mentioned in this book, the Prevent Rigorous Heart Disease, they use maple syrup. It is lower in fructose. And the reason they do it is because it's very, very expensive and people will use it. You know, like with white sugar, it's kind of easy to add extra to it. Um, but really, those are for those occasionally special occasions where you're going to have a special dessert or something. Okay. Like they, our Thanksgiving comes up this weekend, but yours is in November. So you may do something that way. Or people will use uh, dried dates as a date paste and, and use that as a, a sweetener. Okay. Does that, wait, really quick question. Does that book have recipes in it too? It does. It's an, actually okay. it's exclusively a recipe book. It's a companion book to his um, text, Prevent Reverse Heart Disease. Okay. Yeah. That's great. So, right. and, and oh. what I want to share with this is I find this particular one is so good because 
I've tried a lot of the recipes and they've actually turned out exactly how they looked, which is very okay. unusual. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so the next question is from Stella Cozens, and I'm just going to paraphrase a bit. Um, she's basically saying that, um, you know, since this diet is foods that are there to create nitrous oxide, um, isn't that a concern when you're on the uh, the meds like the sildenafil? No, in fact, if anything, that's how it helped me get off the meds because that's what I thought. Yeah, better absorption. Like you know, when you do get your first right heart cath, they often actually check if you can take nitric oxide directly, and yeah. I couldn't tolerate that. And so then, of course, the the first level drug is um, sildenafil. And um, so, in fact, you feel so much better um, doing this. And, um, and it, you know, that's what got me off the drugs. That's great. Um, were you monitoring your, your blood pressure, or your systemic blood pressure when you first uh, went on this diet? Did you notice that dropping? Yeah, my blood pressure was actually very low. It would be not unusual that it would be like um, like 100 over 60 or 50 or even 40. Was and it high when you first got diagnosed? No, it actually was not. Okay. Okay. But mine, was, mine was high. And yeah. then when I started to change my diet and add more vegetables that help yeah. with the, um, the nitro oxide, um, my, and a supplement I take, yeah. um, my blood pressure, I got off my meds within a yeah. week or two. And it wouldn't be unusual at all for, for people who have high blood pressure because the studies that people have done um, have actually shown that their blood pressure goes down by many points. So, yes, it will really help in that area. Cool. Uh, so how do you begin on – this is uh, Deborah Mitchell. How do you begin on this type of diet? What do you start cutting out first and recipes that can go along that would help also? Yeah, so uh, – <laughs> What they would suggest, all the experts have something in common. One of the things that, you know, whether it's the Esselstyn plan, the Dugal plan, and all these, the Furman plan, all these kind of people, you know, Bernard's work, it's all oil-free in the first place. So you don't either cook with oil or bake using oil good, uh, whether they're solidified oil like a lard or Crisco or the different plant-based oils or the uh, animal oils. And then the other thing that's consistent is that um, with regard to this is, um, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. What was the other part of the question? Um, it was, uh, what do you cut off first? Start with? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say the other consistent thing most of them say is that dairy is, well, dairy, we call it the cocaine for the brain because it kind of kind of rocks you, it kind of mellows you out. If anybody's had a Dairy Queen ice cream, they often try to end up falling asleep after. And uh, um, dairy was really used for cows, for their baby cows, so that baby cows would drink the milk. And it, it like, you know, and grow faster. And uh, it would be very calming for them. And so it has some of that effect on us. We don't want to grow that fast. We don't want to grow the way uh, a little baby cow grows into a big cow in, in a matter of months. Um, right. But so dairy is often the one that people find harder to give up. And that's the one they suggest that you try to give up first. Um, and then, then meat. Um, and I think, Trish, you had two ideas. Like either some people jump right in. Uh, but the difficulty with jumping right in is that often you're, you're – behind in your why. Why am I doing this? And then you get stuck on the how because you're not sure how to proceed. You feel like oh, I've just like waved out my pantry and I don't know what to do. And you feel like you're on a desert island with no guidance at all. Um, whereas waving in. So sometimes people will start with by changing their breakfast and then they'll add lunch to it a week later and then they'll add dinner to it late, like later. So for okay. breakfast, something as simple as you can take a mason jar, for example, fill it halfway with oats, put in a plant-based milk, like a no, non-sweetened, um, unsweetened almond milk, right to the, the oat line, and then add just some frozen berries to it, put it in the fridge overnight, and it comes out like a parfait the next morning. 
And okay. that's, I mean, what's great about that is if you have an early morning doctor's appointment, you just take the jar and go with you and you can eat it when, when you have a chance rather than forgetting. And then you go to the hospital cafeteria, which does not have a lot of healthy food, unfortunately. Uh, they're trying, but it's mm, kind of iffy at times um, and do that kind of thing. And then um, some of the recipes I love in this book, for example, is like there's a sloppy joe recipe in here. But if you want to look for recipes right now, if you go to phacanada.com, that's Pulmonary Hypertension Association Canada, phacanada.com, they have low sodium recipes on there. And believe it or not, I've submitted a lot of them and they're plant based. Okay. With all, no right. Oil in them. all right, then I'll put the link with this video. Yeah, please. Um, and so there's quite a few recipes in there for different items. Okay. We got another question? Um, yeah, so Sarah Tobin asked, if we are wanting to thin our blood naturally, how do we know how much ginger, turmeric, garlic, cayenne to eat? And we don't know if this is really in your wheelhouse, but maybe you have some input. Yeah, I'm a dietitian, but what I would say is, to use those ingredients naturally in the foods that you're eating and preparing. Not only will they add flavor, but then you will get their full medicinal flavors because you add benefits because you're absorbing them in that way, you know, rather than okay. a concentrated way. Okay. okay. And then uh, Tina Tea Time Trotter asked, what helps build the immune system that's safe to take with pH meds? Well, certainly um, there are, uh, you know, immune foods are the basic bottom line is, I looked this up as well, just to double check, and it's the crucifix uh, vegetables. So it's those dark leafy green vegetables, like kale, bok choy, broccoli, uh, okay. beets, beet greens, cauliflower, uh, uh, collard greens, uh, arugula, will all help with building the immune system. Okay. You know, I had another post. I think there was a few other questions. Yeah. And they suggested, by the way, eating at least five vegetable servings of fruits and vegetables or more, even up to 10. And they found that when people did that, they could see a noticeable difference just even dealing with the common cold for people okay. that way that compared to the other. And we know a common cold for us could lead to possibly pneumonia, unfortunately. Right. So... So people ask me this, when you say five servings of fruits and vegetables, you mean five vegetables and five fruits, or do you mean yeah, five you altogether? Have, you can have well, at least three servings of fruit. And one of the things is, is if you're concerned around blood sugars, the berry family is your real friend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, whereas compared, if you're diabetic, for example, eating watermelon or pineapple is quite high in sugar. So what they say until you... Um, have your blood sugar stable, it's probably stay away from those two. Neil Bernard would suggest staying away from those two particular fruits. But okay. the berry family, blackberries, blueberries, strawberries, uh, all those raspberries are really fantastic. Okay. So, so you started this diet, mm -hmm. got diagnosed, got the diagnosis of type two diabetes. And from yeah. the time that you started this diet, how long before you got your vision back? How long well, before you became <laughs> off your drugs? It was 15 months later I got off. Um, I was, my vision was restored. It okay. came back slowly. I started to how realize- long, I'm sorry, how long did you say? 15 months. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. And uh, so, because there's very, very tiny blood vessels in the back of the retina, and sometimes they end up breaking, or, or like if you think about just very fragile little branches or twigs, and uh, you're able to put um, uh, to with when you get more um, better blood flow to them and your vasodilated, then you actually improve your sight. And I was amazed it was John McDougal. I was taking his starch solution certificate at the time. And he talked about people being able to reverse their blindness. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to keep doing this. You know, That's awesome. Yeah. Happened. I got so, so how, how long was it before you got off the, the pH drugs? Um, well, they they sort of came off slowly. I'm trying to remember. I don't know if I know. It's I'm around the same. I think it was around the same they time. Pulled, they pulled them off. 
the boy yep. off them totally. Okay. Yeah. And the oxygen too? And then in 2013, I got totally pulled off all the drugs because I ended up going in the hospital because I was on an IV antibiotic for a minor surgery. And um, uh, I ended up finding out we had a terrible flood here. It made all the national news. Um, and uh, so the labs, the blood labs were locked up for three days. They were flooded. And they were wow. backed up. And it was then I found out I had, um, I was rushed to the hospital with 4% kidney functioning. Oh, my goodness. So I came back from that. Um, I gained a lot of fluid and everything. It was a real mess. And I came back from that. And that's when I was taken off completely all my drugs. So it was okay. within the, yeah. Bosentin. Bosentin was the, the drug I was on at that time. Okay. Okay. And your kidneys are doing okay now? Yeah. Well, they're probably at around 11%. And okay. I've been able, I have end stage kidney failure, which is a disappointment, but it's also, I'm so grateful. I'm not on dialysis and I hope to stay off it for as long as possible. And, and I've six stayed this way for six years, which is pretty incredible. That's it's awesome. Unreal. That's yeah. awesome. Wow. And they figured that I mean, my kidneys were damaged because of the drugs, actually, that I found <laughs> at pH. Now, did they take you off the drugs because of that or because you improved so much or a combination uh, of both? They, both that, and they took me off. My nephrologist was really impressed with what I had done. He was one of the real believers, I will say, because I had five specialists in my life at the time. And he was the one who said, look, um, we're gonna, I, I really wanted to try an alternative to the dialysis. And he himself thought, so he talked to my pulmonologist, and one of the problems with the side effect of Bosentin and a lot of our drugs is they actually retain fluid. So that's yeah, right. a lot more pressure on your kidneys, ironically. You know, it's kind of like, and the yeah. problem is with a lot of the medical profession, you know, you have no one who looks at your overall person. They kind of look at your right. body parts. Yeah. And sometimes the body parts, you know, with the drugs they prescribe, it's like, the teacher who, you know, you're in high school again and you're given three assignments and two tests and nobody talks to each other and, and you're overloaded as a student. You don't know what you're going to do, right? Right, and yeah. Together saying this is unrealistic workload for somebody. They only look at their workload. And sure. so we only look at one body part. And we hope our general practitioner will be more of a case manager to look at the whole. But they really aren't. They they As soon as there's something sort of more specialized like this, I think they kind of run a little bit like, I'm going to just step back from this. I'm a little bit scared. I don't want to interfere. I don't know what I'm really talking about because they're more generalist in, in, and don't necessarily understand the specialties. But my nephrologist was very much um, open to working with me, probably, probably the only doctor that was so clearly open. And I'm not saying my pulmonologist, he, the best thing he ever said to me is, Kate, I know nothing about nutrition. Hey, he was and honest. That's, I give him credit. Well, I knew that was a good sign of a good doctor having worked in the operating side for how many years is because I said, when a doctor will admit, put ego aside or put, yeah. I'm supposed to be this professional that has the white coat and white armor that I don't know something that's really valuable to you because you don't waste your time or their time. And you well, can't the doctor that I'm going to, I was going to change doctors because I was having so much trouble with them getting back to me. But anyway, when he finally did get back to me and we talked on the phone, he's like, well, we really need to talk about getting you on the drugs. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And I said, besides I'm feeling great. He's like, why? And I, I said, well, I've changed everything. He's like, like what? So I told him, he's like, oh, I don't know if that would make a difference. I'm like, it has. I'm yeah. living yeah. again. And yeah. he was yeah. like, well, I can't give myself any credit for that. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I stayed with him because it was so, I mean, he's like, well, you did all that. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, well, you know, my pulmonologist even said to me, when we talked to him about approaching him to write part of the taper, he kind of, he took about a year to think about things, which was disappointing, uh, but understandable. He's a cautious guy. And he said to me, he finally said, no, I, I don't think I should do that. But he's very much tied up 
you know, with met, uh, drug trials and that kind of thing. So I understand his situation. And he said, you know, Kate, there are going to be some people who will believe you never had pulmonary hypertension. And I almost fell off the chair in a way. And I don't get surprised that easily, but it, it almost really hit me hard because I thought, well, first of all, you know, I, I'm a pretty private person. I wouldn't normally come out with this, but I felt like I had to come out and try to publish something. And uh, and Dr. Esselstyn co-published it as well as my husband. We co-wrote it all together. And we really, and he, my husband was the lead writer on it, which I really appreciated. And um, we just felt we had to do it because we weren't going to be taken seriously if we didn't somehow, you know? And so we wanted to be able to at least pay we hoped PH patients would take this to their doctor and say, look, here's somebody, it may work for me, it may not, but it's not going to harm me to try. Right. I'm not right. going to get sicker because I ate some carrots and I ate some, you know, yeah, uh, potato right. and I had all these great foods. Yeah, it's true. So is and that, that is really, really good? I think that's the thing that people forget. Um, is, it, you know, in all of this, is that this is a food with flavor. It, it's real, and it, it's very satisfying to eat this way. And yeah. um, I think it's even brought my husband and I, like he's sitting here with me. <laughs> I should maybe oh, bring yeah. him in. His name is Andrew. Oh, yeah. and Jake. Hi, this is Jake. Yeah, can you see? Uh, there's little Jake. There you go. Hi. Yeah. But I think we brought us closer together as a couple. You know, if I put my marriage therapist hat on, because <laughs> a lot more, we have to sort of, it's kind of like us against the world of like, okay, if we're traveling, where are we going to eat? What are we going to do? We're going to look for hotels that have bar fridges and microwaves. And, you know, we kind of get a plan together and we communicate even a lot more about this. Yeah. And we also know that, you know, with my loss of income, with this disease is that we're not gonna have a lot to leave our three kids, but the legacy of health, that's kind of priceless. And Absolutely. So it's really good that they're like our son Thomas is uh, follows this and our daughter Megan's on track for it. Our son, Chris, he's not sure he's interested, but he's a much bigger fruits and vegetables eater. So that's, you know, and yeah. Uh, hey, if you could get away from the processed food and just start to add yeah. fruits and vegetables, yeah. my cat's being really naughty behind us. That's so We're just gonna ignore her it's in the video. I, I'm laughing. We have a cat too. <laughs> <laughs> she she knows she's not supposed to be up there, but well, she's like, you're not gonna yell at me on video. <laughs> Well, this has been great. Um, I'm going to put some links that book. I'll get the full yes. title and put the link um, yes. and the link to the on Amazon. And, and I don't get any profits from it or anything like that. But it is a very it's one of the books that I do suggest to people um, because just because the recipes are simple, they're everyday food, grocery store ingredients usually. Okay. And, um, you know, and, and what's so nice is the other thing I'd recommend by way of in your kitchen, and you'll notice on the website PHA Canada, where I do the low sodium recipes and they're plant based that are mine, is that I use an Instapot as well. I found that okay. has given me a lot of energy. I but, love my Instant Pot to make hard-boiled eggs, which I know that you're... <laughs> it makes the best hard-boiled eggs. I bet it does. <laughs> it makes a lot of other really, really great things too, Chris. Tomato basil soup. Um, uh, lots of Indian dishes like oh. crazy and ala gobi and chana masala. Yeah, I, I do need to use my Instant Pot more. It costs enough. I need to use it more, not just yeah. for hard world. <laughs> I just found a way of saving energy. Like you can even, what's neat about it though, let's say you don't want to um, fry something, you know, and, you, and you're using the water or anything. If you use the saute feature on the Instant Pot, then you don't have to necessarily stand over it quite the same way either. Oh, that's a great idea. You just saute the onion to start with, and then okay. you have your other and things you put in there, just about your stuff. And you can also put okay. a lot of vegetables in there and different things like that too. Okay. So, All right, that's a great idea. Yeah.
Well, my computer, he's he's running to get a cord. My computer's ready to go dead. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody for all their questions and everything. And are you recording this by any chance? You know, it is. I'll share it. Uh, it's going to be on the page. And uh, yeah, it'll be recorded there. So people could go back. Can you share it on YouTube at all, Trish? Or? Um, can we share this on YouTube? He's trying to get the cord yeah. before my... <laughs> If, if you sent it to me, then maybe we could put it on my YouTube channel. Because okay. I have some people that contact me from all over the world about PH, and then I'd be happy to put it on that channel as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that we can do that. And we're new to the we're new to this. Uh, sure. This, but I'm pretty sure that you could do that. So I will. I'll send it to you. That'd be Thank great. Thank you so much. Well, it's been fun. We learned yes, a lot. Yes. We'll share some links. And if we, if you guys have any questions that we didn't cover, if you want to put it below. Um, and then, Kate, when you get a chance, maybe you could, you know, look at the questions if anybody leaves some. Um, yes. Yeah, this was great. And they can enjoyed, always I enjoyed it. And I do consultations by Zoom, so I can do something like we just did, but by Zoom in a private conversation. I do coaching. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'm um, sure that I'm a lot of people in sort of the psychological solutions for the plant for your plant based journey. So I can help people. You know, health behavior changes are can always be challenging. Uh, healthy habits are hard, but we can overcome them together. And uh, the other thing is that we have our 2020 Fork Smart Summit that's coming up where we have Michael Greger and then we'll have T. Colin Campbell. And some people aren't going to want to make the two dates. We have two dates this year just because we were fortunate enough to have Michael, uh, Michael Greger come and say yes to us. And we didn't want to say no. So um, if, if there are single tickets available for either date as well. So they can where, where is that being held? That'll be at four at that's in Calgary, Alberta. Okay. And it's uh forksmartsummit.com. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we'll share all that below. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Kate. Thank you. And so we will share. All right, take care. We'll see you on the page. Okay. <laughs> Bye now. Bye, Jim. Bye -bye. Bye.